Okay, so the high key isn't really new, but I thought I'd take a first look at this 96 board format SBC from Le Mega. Is that French? Le Mega. Sounds French. As you'll find out in this video, I had a number of issues with this board that really soaked up my time. I was expecting better for an 18 month old SBC, but there's some really good aspects to it. So what do we have on this high key? Starting from the top right, working clockwise. A DC power jack, which is so much better than the micro USB type power connectors. Solar point for external antenna. Dirty fingernail. Two USB 2.0 ports. Six user controlled LEDs. USB 2.0 OTG, 96 board high speed GPIO connector, HDMI, micro SD slot, UART 0 which I'll cover later, jumpers for various boot options, a 96 board standard 40 pin GPIO and a power button. We also have a Texas Instruments Wi-Fi and Bluetooth radio, a MediaTek PMIC, a high silicon Kira 620 which is an 8 core ARM Cortex A53 with dynamic frequency up to 1.2 GHz. 8 cores. This is going to generate some heat. Then there's 2 gigs of DDR3 RAM. You can also get it in 1 gig models. On the dark side there's 8 gig NAND EMMC, or the other model has 4 gigs. Another dirty fingernail, MIPI DSi MUX chip, a MIPI DSi and HDMI chip from analog devices, Texas Instruments USB multiplexer, and an SMSC USB 2.0 3 port hub. Nice. One sad aspect of this board is the lack of 3.3 volts on the GPIO header. The other possible issue is the 2mm pitch used for the GPIO header, which is standard for 96 boards, but it means if you don't use any daughter boards, then you'll be in trouble. Connecting up is trivial with keyboard and mouse, HDMI and the juice. Alas, no Ethernet on board. The high key can handle from 8 to 18 volts, so I'll bump up my power supply to 12 volts. Powering on saw the peak current hit 422 milliamps and finally settling down to around 170 milliamps. Bidding was pretty speedy, showing a desktop in under 15 seconds. Hmm, nice. Interestingly, powering off never saw this change. Hmm, something is going wrong here. So the first step is to connect to Wi-Fi since there's no Ethernet on board. There's many ways of doing this. I was just lazy and used the GUI this time. Then logged in for my Mac. Since I'm doing several days of testing, I'll need access to the onboard temperature sensor. It's always nice seeing 8 cores on any machine, and this kernel also has access to the dynamic CPU frequency scaling. You can also see what voltages the PMIC is spitting out. I went through an upgrade process to make sure I had the latest and greatest, and while I did that, I logged the CPU frequency and temperature. Hmm. As expected, the CPU was being throttled without any heatsink attached and the current was averaging 250 milliamps with a peak of 282 milliamps. I'll definitely need a heatsink of some sort. I've moved all my test software onto NFS storage, so first mount it all up, and install all the packages I need, and yes, CPU throttling, even just doing simple tasks. As soon as it gets to around 45 degrees Celsius, it starts to pull back. So once I had everything installed, time for a quick test to bash all eight CPU cores. You can see the CPU being throttled a lot, never really staying at the full 1.2 GHz for long. Interesting how the temperature can rise 24 degrees in 10 seconds. Halfway through the test I added a small copper heatsink. I wanted to highlight that using these small copper heatsinks are sort of okay, but not really efficient if you want to hammer the CPU. Even adding a fan doesn't make much difference at all. So for these multi-core socks, get yourself a decent heatsink. During this test, the current draw never exceeded 611 milliamps. That's pretty decent for an 8 core SOC, and it's the lowest I've seen out of all the SBCs I've tested so far. So, I'm doing things a little differently in this video, and starting with performance tests first. Time to add on Micmake's patent pending heatsink. 
but there's not a heck of a lot of room there. So I added some of the flexible heatsink material, which just so happens to be an electrical insulator, and placed it on top of the sock as best I could. There you go, perfect. Just powering up the fan on this heatsink saw a current draw of 200 milliamps, so remember that for later. Look at that, that's so much better, staying around the 30 degree mark. So time for another bash of the CPU. The temperature quickly rose to 52 degrees and stayed there the whole time and spent almost the whole time at 1.2 GHz. At that clock rate, it started to hit 566 milliamps current draw, which seems odd that it consumed less, but anyway. This sock is one of the better ones I've seen. It runs a lot cooler than any of the others, and seems able to dissipate heat energy through its casing better. So far, this might be one of the best 8-core SBCs around. So, over a day, I ran a bunch of Phoronix tests, and the results are in. The Haiku performed really well, being on par with the Jetson TX1, Upboard and NanoPi M3, with all three boards jostling for the number one position. Overall, the Haiku was just lagging behind the Upboard with the occasional odd spike. Some of the results had some wide variances, and I might have to repeat the tests on those. But time and time again, I saw those three boards jostling for the same position, with, surprisingly, the Pine 64 poking its head in every so often. Interestingly, over the entire test run, the maximum temperature hit 74 degrees. Pretty hot for that little chip, but with an average of 33 degrees Celsius. So, on to some Wi-Fi performance testing. iPerf testing showed up a massive 39.6 megabits per second on TCP tests. Nice for a plain onboard antenna. And UDP tests showed up a 1.4 millisecond jitter, and only one packet losing its way. Even better. I didn't test with an external antenna, but we'll add this to my tests in a follow-up review. Next onto some GPIO testing. We have a bucket load of GPIOs on the sock, along with some onboard LEDs. Okay, it's boring, but for completeness, let's check them out. Uh-huh, yep, they work. Nice to see the kernel stop flashing the Wi-Fi activity LED when I use it. And GPIO testing was, uh, okay, now that's odd. I couldn't get any of the GPIOs to function at all. I didn't check this out further in this kernel version as I was keen to upgrade to 4.4.0. On to ITC, using my handy dandy MCP9808 temperature sensor. Only one ITC bus, which is odd, as I should have three, and there's four devices on it, but not the sensor. Hmm. Looking at the schematic, I can see that these aren't the devices I'm looking for. Just to be sure, I chucked on my cheap logic analyzer to the ITC bus, but just saw some flatlining. Okay. Another test for after the upgrade. Over at 96 boards, there's a relatively new release of Debian Jesse. Well, for me, it's almost a year old now, but let's try it anyway. So I burned it to an SD, chucked it in, and powered it on. Okay, looks like there's something wrong here. So time for some more debugging with a handy Raspberry Pi, since I'm working on 5 volt logic levels. Okay, so it's booting properly, but not handing over to the SD card for some reason. So I removed the SD card, booted off the EMMC, put the SD card back in, and mounted it up. Strange, it all seems to be there. It wasn't until I checked the forums that it turns out that the latest release doesn't actually work. So I moved the Pi over to UART0, which is the default console, and tried to boot from SD manually. Hmm, that's really odd. Okay, so if I run the grub bootloader from EMMC, I can use that to boot from SD card. Whoops, seems that the SD card can't be seen. The forums did mention that the type of SD card that you use matters, so I tried a better one. But I had exactly the same results. I don't know what's going on here, but you would think that they would have discovered it and fixed it in almost 10 months. Okay, so only thing for it is to upgrade the EMMC directly. First connect the high key to your PC via the OTG port. Move this jumper to here and power on the board. If you look on the 96 board website, you'll see several different instructions, but essentially you want to drop the board into fast boot mode, and there's two ways to do this. First download the image, along with all these other files, make sure you get the right version for your board. This Python program is used to write the loader onto your high key, but it seems to be using an outdated version of the serial Python library. So I modified it slightly, and managed to load it up. The green light will come on when it's loaded. You can double check that it's loaded up by running the fast boot program, and then begin to load up all the files in order. But for some reason, it always just hung there, doing nothing. 
Another issue is if you're not quick enough, the high key will vanish off the USB bus after around 60 seconds. So instead of using that method, I'll load up Fastboot directly from the UIFI menu. To do this, make sure you move the jumper over to this position. After that, I could see the high key from Fastboot and then load up all the images into EMMC. Make sure you load up each of the files in order. It matters. Then once finished, remove the jumper and power on. Another issue I found is that the first time you boot after EMMC upgrade, it'll spit out this onto the console. Don't panic, just power off and on again. <sighs> okay, looks like the kernel image is missing. This can be fixed by changing the kernel file reference to this in the grub boot menu, which then eventually boots correctly. Nice to see the ITC buses there, but still no SPI. And all the GPIOs are there, along with the LEDs. So before I start testing, I'll need to make a small change so it'll boot up automatically. Then reboot. After rebooting, I could see that I also had access to the PMIC and the dynamic CPU frequency scaling. So I ran another batch of Phronix tests on this new kernel. There wasn't a heck of a lot of difference except for the interprocess message passing improvements that were introduced in the kernel 4 series. The CPU stayed at a fairly respectable average of 33 degrees, but hit a maximum of 89 several times. Not much changed on the newer kernel, apart from a bit of overheating. However, repeating the Wi-Fi tests saw performance drop dramatically by a factor of 10 to 1 on TCP. And UDP wasn't so bad, but started to look a little like the Pi Zero W. So where was I? Oh, that's right, back to I2C testing. There's the three I2C buses there, nice. But my temperature sensor wasn't appearing on any of them. Turned out that my MCP9808 was dead for some reason. So I moved on to a LUX sensor, which appeared on bus zero. I was able to read it without issue. SPI testing was another story. I enabled it in the device tree, rebooted, but nada, zip, nothing. If you check out the forums, there's mention of SPI on ITC being fully functional on the high-speed interface, but I didn't get one of those boards, unfortunately. Since this board has a wide DC power supply range, I thought I'd run it off a standard 9 volt battery and see how long it would last. So connected it all up and let it sit idle for the duration. It was pulling at most 280 milliamps, but eventually died 30 minutes later. After that, it would just sit there in a boot loop cycle as there wasn't enough juice to power up the Wi-Fi radio. But still, it's pretty good. So I had a real mixed bag of results on this board. If you want to use GPIOs without any daughter board, then you'll find a lot of issues. But if you do, there's many more options for you. The wide DC power supply is a welcome relief and means you can use it in many more applications, like powering directly from a vehicle battery. But the lack of any 3.3 volt header is a bit of a bugger for boards requiring it. This is one of the better 64-bit 8-core SBCs I've seen around and matches the others on performance while running a lot cooler. For non-demanding applications, you could always get away with a reasonably small heatsink. There is a lot of support for this board, but be careful if you're not prepared to hack around a bit getting things to work. It's one of those boards that's aimed at the experienced hacker, and I'd see this board being used in robotics, vision analytics, and even as part of a compile cluster. So what rating would I give it? While the company website is very clear on expectations and doesn't make any bold claims. There's stuff that works and stuff that doesn't. I give it an overall rating of 4.2 out of 5. So thanks for watching and see you next week.